his hand up in this room and says, I will fill this room with gold and twice over with silver if you let me go. Um, problem with that is warriors from all over the Incan Empire were coming, and by day, the Spanish saw more and more and more fires growing, thinking, oh my God, they're going to kill us. When if Lupa solves the problem and says, hey, if you let me go, I'll do this for you, the Spanish say, yeah, dude, that's awesome. The room is filled with gold and silver, and then they just kill Athlupa. Since he was a god king, the people fall apart, and they really do not know um, what to do after that. And the people are very shortly thereafter um, enslaved. Everybody good? All right, now you guys have a decision to make. We can quickly go over like colonization, like the encomienda and all that stuff, or we can go with decolonization. What would you guys like to do? Decolonization. All right, decolonization. All right. Real fast, we know colonization. Um, the European conquistadors come in, um, and they just um, take over. The Olmecs. Um, are the oldest civilization in the Americas. We're talking 1500 BC, right about the time the Aryans roll into India. Two big cities in ancient Mexico is San Lorenzo and La Venta. It's very difficult to see them today, the foundational empires of Mexico, because the land has retaken over um, where they used to um, exist. We know about the transatlantic economy, mercantilism, rule of the colonies, give wealth to the mother country, and you can only trade with the mother country and not each other. This is the famous Colombian exchange or the triangle trade. The new world supplies the raw materials, Europe turns them into finished products, and Africa supplies the labor. We know all this, it's a large missionary effort, so in imperialism, we talked about it today at lunch, one of the things we can do is convert all of their heathen souls to Christianity before we kill them. That brings us to Bartolome de la Casas, who writes that black legend, and the Spanish crown was into this because they used mercury to help extract precious metals, silver ore, not only are the people poisoned by it, but it destroys the landscape as well. But the Spanish didn't care because you can't see it from my house. And we're getting rich, so we really honestly don't care. So looking at this, all of this is stuff colonized by Spain. Up and down from Argentina all the way up into what is today Montana and um, Idaho. Why did they get the like western side of it? Because Pizarro and Balbon guys sailed up here and they found a lot of gold. And the British and the French were over here and they didn't want to start a war. Um, we know about the encomienda, the repartimiento, the hacienda. 50 million slaves there when Cortez shows up. A uh, hundred years later, there's only two million left, which starts the slave trade. Okay, great. There's a look at um, the mountain of Patesi, a veritable mountain made of silver um, in Peru. I'm not going to go down in there, so I'm going to make the natives do it. And the world, 80% of the world's wealth will eventually come out of the Patesi silver mine in Peru. It goes far away as Japan. It will start the Senshi banks over in China, and it's all done on forced exploited labor. The French did much better because they were just trying to get fur. The English are master manipulators. They'll get two sides to fight each other so they can um, take over. So anyway, um, one of the things we don't want to forget, it's not PC, but the Africans um, played a role in the triangle slave, slave trade. The Kingdom of Mali started plantation slavery. And it's where the Portuguese first went. Africans would go into Africa to capture their rivals and sell them to the um, Europeans. Boom, boom, and boom. Uh, okay, we're all good there? All right. 
Now, that's how the Americas are run throughout, you know, colonization. They're, you know, still having, you know, wealth extracted to them um, in the age of imperialism. Um, they throw off, um, you guys want to do like this, the, the revolutions real, you guys get that Boulevard, San Martin, you guys um, got all of that? Okay. Well, the revolutions are over, and then we get into the 1900s. And Jose de San Martin's country, Argentina, was one of the wealthiest nations in all of Latin America. It has enormous great former Spanish or Portuguese landowners who are nobles. And they're living well until the Great Depression hits worldwide. Again, we think about it only here in America, but we know it hits Germany, we know it hits Japan hard, and when it does, the government destabilizes and it causes the military to take over and lead and run for about 50 years. Shortly after the end of World War II, when the world is trying to repair the damage of that conflict, we get a guy named Juan Perón, who is very popular, and he is going to um, take over. He is elected as president. And he says, Argentina should be for Argentina. Exactly what Mao Zedong said in China, exactly what Ho Chi Minh said in Vietnam, we're going to get rid of multinational corporations, we are going to increase wages for our poor, and we're going to get our workers, you know, good benefits, cost of living, and safe working um, conditions. Juan is greatly aided by his wife, Eva Perone. They made a, a, a movie about her. I think Madonna played her character um, several years ago. And she was extremely popular, but she dies. The movie's called Evita. And she was like a, um, a Theodora, Justinian's wife, Theodora. She was a powerful woman. She advocated for the building of schools, helping the poor, building hospitals. Eva Perón was one of the people. And when she dies in 1955, Juan kind of goes berserk. He really doesn't know what to do. Ben and Ben, have a fantastic day, gentlemen. Um, he slowly begins to turn against all of his opposition. For a while, if you spoke out against him or disagreed with him, that was okay. Then he becomes um, oppressive. He begins to turn on those he thinks who is a threat. So just like in China, under the great cultural revolution, and in Rome when it was falling, the educated and the wealthy just simply turn and leave. They turn and um, bail. When that happens, Perón's government is forced to take over the, the industry. Everybody who knew how to do it is gone. And it's like my buddy Bob working at the GM plant. All of a sudden, Bob's in charge of art, and then it completely falls apart, and Argentina goes into an economic tailspin. Perón is kicked out. And so for 20 years, from 1950 to 1970, different military leaders, colonels, generals, use their military connections in the military to put themselves in and out of power. Things don't get better, and so the people say, hey, if we can control him, the one guy that tried to help us is Juan Perón. So they bring him back in 1973. He's going to roll up his sleeves. He's going to go to work. And unfortunately, he dies. Bam. Now he gets married to a new wife named Isabel. And people were hoping that Isabel would be the new Eva Perón. She's the first woman president in Latin American history. The only problem with Isabel and this macho patriarchal society is she's a woman. You can't have a woman rolling. Who are you, senorita? What? So they kick her butt to the curb two years later. 
And this starts a thing known as the Dirty War. Um, the world kind of tried to turn a blind eye to it as the Argentinian military will wage war on its own citizens. The closest thing to it is Maximilian Robespierre's um, uh, French Revolution where 20,000 Argentinians um, are killed. And Pol Pot, exactly. Pol Pot and the Dirty War in Argentina, excellent. Excellent sources of um, synthesis. By 1983, um, there was a war in the Falkland Islands. Argentina said that they would go out and capture those to pump up their economy. They were beaten down by the British um, very quickly. And after that, things settled down. The government stabilized. And by the 90s, the economy is thriving once again. Technology and cattle trade. Cattle and beef farming is a, is a big boom. And Argentina is slowly um, becoming one of a very powerful, modern, first world country down in South America. You guys ready? All right, Nicaragua. Oh boy, Nicaragua, Central America. All right, Central America. After the, um, I'm trying to outshout those idiots outside. They do this every day. I don't know what it is, but it's just all, it's the same three guys. I'm, they're not doing anything wrong, but I don't know why they come after like football practice and decide to like use stuff. They're not doing anything wrong. I'm gonna yell at Maybe my hearing, can you guys hear them? Yeah, yeah. Right, my hearing is just so cute that I don't, they're just cars for them, so they're probably gonna leave. Raquel's bailing. All right, have a good day with you. All right. Um, landowning nobles, again, these are the descendants of the old um, Spanish, are going to run the government and the military there. So the people are kept beaten down and extremely poor. There is the growing threat of communism. And one thing we can't have is communists invading in and around our sphere of influence in Central America, especially with Fidel Castro on the loose. From 1936 to 1979, the Somoza family is going to rule Nicaragua, a one family dynasty. They were not the nicest people in the world. They were kind of like old school dictators. Um, and we did. Um, we kept them in power simply because they were United States friendly. But um, in 1970, there were groups um, that were beginning to oppose the Somoza family, and they um, do not like the grandson, a guy named Anastasio Somoza, who was just pillaging the entire countryside. So the reform movement takes the name Sandinistas, about a young um, reformer who fought against colonial power back in the day. The Sandinistas want to overthrow Somoza. This kicks off an enormous American history controversy where we back both sides. It's called the Iran-Contra affair, where we sold some guns to the Iranians for money that we then gave to the Sandinistas when we were really supposed to be supporting the Somozas. And classic American faction, we're supporting everybody and taking guns from Iran and giving them to the rebel groups because if they get caught with them, they're from Iran, there's no way Americans are touching anything Iranian. You may remember Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North got in front of Congress and was asked about it. He goes, well, I'm not sure, I don't. Remember, I don't recall, and nobody really knows what happened. We're pretty sure we do, but now Oliver North was the fall guy. He now gets $40,000 a night to come and give a speech. And I'm like, dude, he was the fall guy for the Reagan administration government. Anyway, the Sandinistas, as always, are young nationalistic men, and yes, sir. Um, so the, this is the decolonization. Are they like decolonizing from like? Corporations or not, corporations are getting ready to move in. 
instead of nations doing this, multinational corporations and say, hey, we're going to help you out, like Coca-Cola in Brazil, um, oil fields, places like that. So the decolonization here, is that just like from their landowning elite? Yes, okay. yes, landowning elite. Um, the nationalists, just like um, the students in China, just like um, the rebels in Boston or the French Revolution, are these young students who want change, even the students in um, Russia. In 1979, they elect a president named Daniel Ortega. He is supposed to be a new type of leader that's going to lead. Oh my God, it's not that big a deal. It's not that big a deal. It's not that big a deal. Um, Ortega wants to do what Castro did. He wants to redistribute land to the people of Nicaragua. We're going to take from the rich, we're going to give to the poor. Like the Gracchi brothers, like Castro, like Ho Chi Minh, like everybody else. Problem is he wants to do it on lines of socialism. He wants to be one of those socialists. This starts a massive civil war and Nicaragua suffers for decades. A lot of the war is financed by illegal drug traffic. The Sandinistas are able to remain in power until the 1990s when the UN is forced to step in and democratic elections are held. Nicaragua is a very poor, war-torn country to this very day, so they are still trying to recover from some of that um, damage. Yes, sir. So Ortega is the president now. Like, how did he get back in? Because things did not get any better, and so they put the guy in because under him they actually made progress. Okay. So great point. That is a reoccurring theme in Latin America. We put a leader in. When they don't work, they're exiled. So we bring them back, kind of like Bolivar. How many times was he kicked out of Venezuela and Napoleon? During the, and Napoleon. So, does that make sense? Mexico, and I'm trying, there's, you know, Latin American countries are, they're, they're full of stuff. Um, we'll talk about Mexico and Haiti, and then we are done. Um, 1870s, Mexico has declared itself independent from Spain. But they're having a difficult time in that 50 years in between. And they were, they were governed by a guy named Porfiro Diaz. And Diaz is a general who once again comes to power based on the backs of the army. And he says that he's going to be a Robin Hood, he's going to help out the poor, and he's going to make them wealthy. And as soon as he gets into power, he does absolutely nothing. He is very similar to many of the African dictators we talked about the other day. His slogan is order and progress. Order and progress. He will stay in power all the way until 1911, right before World War I. He faces a very outspoken opponent named Francisco Madero. And Madero uh, makes himself out to be like one of the Roman Gracchi brothers. He is from an old and a wealthy family, um, like the Gracchi brothers. He had studied in the United States. And he runs for president, but he upset... Uh, <clears throat> Diaz so much, he was kicked out and exiled. Because he turned his back on the poor people, Diaz will run up against two grassroots Mexican rebels, Pancho Villa and Emiliano Zapata, kind of like bandito war leaders, and they lead armies against Diaz. So these are like peasants Kind of like the English Civil War fighting against the trained professional army. 
Both leaders supported Madero, and they campaigned for the poor. 1911, Diaz steps down, and Zapata and Villa bring back Madero from the United States. He gets back to Mexico and says, guys, this is what we're going to do, and he is assassinated. So the theme in Latin America is, if we do not like you, we will just assassinate you. He is replaced by General Victorano Huerta, who is extremely unpopular with Zapata and Villa. Huerta did nothing to help the poor people. He turns the army loose on, his, on these two guys. And so Zapata and Villa, as World War I is breaking out, bring in a guy named, I know this is a lot, um, President Carranza. And Carranza gets into a lot of trouble because he has handed the Zimmer telegram from Germany asking to invade the southern United States to keep us out of the war. Carranza makes the enormous mistake of trying to have the army root out and kill the two rebel bandits. <clears throat> he also tells the people he's going to give them a new constitution based on American ideals. Number one, going to give the land back to the people which he doesn't. It is the Mexican government that should control Mexico's resources. And here is what Nabil was talking about. Limit foreign control and business inside Mexico. Mexico wasn't dominated by a foreign country as much as they were multinational corporations. And Mexico had enjoyed the veal of the Monroe Doctrine, Europeans stay the heck out, but they were also subjected to heavy American influence. And so Mexico has got to deal with American financial support that is given to people just like everywhere else. We don't care what you do as long as you support our interests. All right, we'll try and um, wrap this up. President Roosevelt in 1932 will adopt the good neighbor policy, which means we will no, not intervene. The government, the corporations will not bother you. We removed our military troops from Haiti and Nicaragua as a show of good faith. We're just going to leave you alone. And in 1929, Mexico had created the Institute Institutional Revolutionary Party known as the PIR. And while the PIR dominates for decades trying to get everybody to work together, farmers, military men, business leaders, the Cold War after 1945 forces America to once again intervene to make sure Mexico does not become communist. By the 1980s, the industrial powers, the United States and Japan, will once again reintroduce multinational corporations into Japan to manufacture automobile parts, automobiles, and electronics for dirt cheap labor. The Mexican laborers will do it for a song. And so the people are exploited while the government and the PIR makes a bunch of money. So the North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA, is written, which is supposed to open up borders between Canada, the United <coughs> States, and Mexico. But Mexico simply cannot compete with the more highly advanced Canada and United States, so it doesn't help them one single iota which leads to the flood of 
uh, immigration. And the last country we will talk about is poor Haiti. <clears throat> Haiti's decolonization as the European powers just simply left. They leave a guy in charge named Dr. Francois de Vallier, known as the Papa Doc. Much like Joseph Stalin and Adolf Hitler and many other groups, he forms a secret police to destroy and eliminate all opposition. He takes all the foreign aid and money and pockets it for himself. 1986, the world was excited that he had died and his son Jean-Claude takes over. He was nicknamed the Baby Doc. He was even more maniacal and psychotic than his dad. And four years later, in 1990, Jean Bertrand Aristide is a, was a folk hero. He was a priest, like Father Miguel Hidalgo in Mexico. And he <coughs> begins to speak out about this. And he goes, Haitians live in what he called dignified poverty. He takes over and is quickly thrown out because everyone expected Haiti to go from rags to riches overnight. So in Latin America, the problems come from militaries. Military generals will take over like they do in Africa. The United Nations has to intervene. Aristide returns to power. Once again, he was thrown out and brought back. Um, when Haiti is ravaged by an earthquake. Um, it is the poorest country in the third, in the, in the, the Western Hemisphere to this day. Um, they have never recovered from the effects of colonization and, and, and imperialism. In the 1960s, President Kennedy helps create the Organization of American States, created to promote democracy and stop communism. The United States has pumped in billions and billions of dollars to see this happen. And while communism has been kept at bay for the most part, many of the countries are still trapped in third world poverty. The only two countries to really successfully break away are the massive economies of Brazil and Venezuela. Venezuela on their oil on wealth and Brazil on their massive ecosystem and labor force. And that, everybody, is Mesoamerica from the Mayas to NAFTA. James, you want to give us a shout out before we hit stop here? Of course. Uh, guys, show some love down below. Smash that like button. Don't forget to subscribe and click the little bell to turn on post notifications. I have no idea what any of that means, but we're going to go with it. All right.